totally in the dark here. I need to be able to read my notes. Good afternoon. Uh, Jim Queen and I surely welcome this occasion to talk with you about land genealogy. Uh, back in the 1700s, the British government uh, granted land to encourage settlement of South Carolina. Typically, a, a person would petition to be granted land, and if the uh, petition was approved by His Majesty's Council, uh, the Surveyor General uh, directed a deputy surveyor to survey a tract of land for which a plat was drawn and certified. So these are the colonial plats that, uh, that are the primary subject of today's presentation. Uh, for a number of years, I've worked with uh, plats along the Congaree River and in Amelia Township, much of which is uh, in present-day Calhoun County. More recently, I've worked with plats on both sides of the Santee River and the Watery River. In May of uh, last year, uh, George and Carol Summers approached Jim Queen about uh, generating landscape maps of uh, colonial plats, uh, focusing on plats in present-day Clarendon County. So that's, uh, that's what you'll see uh, today, are, are uh, plat clusters uh, primarily in, uh, in, Pro in uh, Clarendon County. I remember uh, Jim's reaction at our first meeting. Um, Jim declared uh, landscape maps of plats to be a giant puzzle and interestingly enough, uh, Karen McNutt uh, used a very similar expression yesterday uh, about uh, these uh, plat maps being uh, a puzzle. Uh, today you'll see uh, several plat clusters in the giant puzzle. Um, all of the clusters that you'll see continue to be works in progress. We continue to refine them, to add to them, and to connect them. And I will apologize uh, in advance that several of the clusters are blurred. Um, we uh, learned to our great sorrow that uh, some clarity was lost when uh, emailed images uh, were uh, converted into the PowerPoint frame. So uh, we'll uh, deal with that uh, another time. The, uh, the goals of the plat mapping include what you see on the screen here, researching the plats, constructing and digitizing the plats, arranging them into clusters, locating the clusters of plats on topographic maps, and uh, using these uh, maps to uh, locate historical sites. I'll add uh, a couple of uh, goals to that list, one being to uh, compile a database for the land parcels, uh, also to document the rationale for positioning the tracts, and uh, hopefully to uh, enhance functionality of the online index of the uh, Department of Archives and History. Uh, some of the available resources are the plats, which are accessible, the colonial plats are accessible online uh, at the website of the uh, Department of Archives and History. Uh, U.S. Geological Survey maps, uh, a link uh, identified there various county records, and in the folder that uh, you've received uh, as you uh, registered or checked in today, there's a, a sheet of information that has some uh, uh, nifty uh, information, uh, has some uh, nifty facts about uh, uh, the, uh, the plats and the technology and such. Uh, the length of uh, property lines back in the colonial times were measured and expressed as chains, where uh, one chain is 66 feet long. So uh, you need to remember that number for the final exam today. One chain is 66 feet. Uh, to this list of resources, I'll add a couple um, that uh, are helpful. Uh, petitions for land, the land grants, memorials, deeds of conveyance, wills and mortgages. And I'm sure there are other resources as well, but those are uh, some that, uh, that I find useful uh, for the, the work that we've been pursuing. Uh, this is an example of the uh, uh, USGS topographic maps uh, from a time before 
the Santee River was uh, impounded to form Lake Marion. And through uh, Jim's uh, former uh, uh, employment at USGS and his uh, uh, knowledge of uh, what sorts of uh, resources are available through uh, USGS, uh, we'll have uh, access to these uh, uh, historic, uh, as I refer to them, uh, maps uh, before uh, uh, the Lake Marion uh, came into uh, existence. Uh, this Manning Quadrangle uh, being uh, an example. And it occurs to me to mention as well that the blue arrow that you see on uh, this and uh, subsequent uh, plat uh, frames and such uh, points to the north. Uh, just a quick overview of some of the clusters at which we'll be looking today. Uh, we'll be starting at Scott's Lake, working our way down the Santee River, uh, where you'll see some of the, the clusters as they're identified here. Um, and with that uh, brief uh, overview of the, uh, of the clusters, we'll take a look at, uh, at the first cluster. Um, this uh, cluster that uh, the gym has drawn begins a short distance from Scott's Lake, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm wrong sheet here. Um, previous uh, Francis Marion symposiums have mentioned the British Post, uh, known as Fort Watson, built atop the uh, Indian Mound at Scotts Lake. Uh, Scotts Lake is an example of an oxbow lake. Uh, the bow-shaped lake in the abandoned channel after the river shifted into, uh, into a new channel. Uh, this cluster of three plats, uh, with the earliest of the three plats being this uh, 1737 plat. So uh, as a result of, uh, of uh, knowing that the 1737 plat, which uh, shows Scott's Lake, obviously uh, Scott's Lake existed uh, in 1737. Um, these plats can sometimes be useful to uh, figure out just uh, when uh, Oxbow Lakes were formed. We really don't know how much earlier than 1737 uh, Scott's Lake had uh, had uh, been cut off by the uh, by the Santee River. Scotts Lake, of course, is now beneath the waters of Lake Marion, but uh, because of uh, its proximity to uh, the uh, Indian Mound in uh, Santee National Wildlife Refuge, uh, uh, Scotts Lake serves as an anchor point for uh, some of our uh, plat mapping. Okay, the, uh, this next cluster begins a short distance uh, downriver from Scotts Lake. Uh, with a series of uh, riverfront tracks. Uh, the ones at which I've just pointed, uh, most of them were granted either to uh, James Kinlock, or Francis Kinlock, or John Mayrant. Um, the cluster, uh, this cluster also includes an area known as the, the Great Savannah, which would be in this uh, vicinity. Um, a savanna being an area characterized by grasses uh, with scattered trees um, in contrast to a heavily forested uh, area. So the, the bottomland forest along the Santee River floodplain would have been flanked landward by, uh, by, the, by the savanna. The, uh, the eastern part of this cluster um, is in the vicinity of uh, present-day uh, Pine Island unit of the Santee uh, Wildlife Refuge. Um, and the savanna, which I pointed, the Great Savannah, uh, through here, uh, appears on Muzon's 1775 map. Um, it's identified on Muzon's map as Farrar Savannah uh, because Benjamin Farrar had purchased many tracts of land from the original grantees. Uh, Mr. Farrar, Dr. Farrar, was a man of uh, diverse interests, a doctor, a planter, a deputy surveyor, and a land speculator on a significant scale. Uh, for example, in uh, 1777, um, Benjamin Farrar sold 8,500 acres at the Great Savannah to uh, Gabriel Manigo, who was uh, one of the wealthiest persons uh, 
in the province of South Carolina at that time. Uh, we'll look briefly at a couple of parcels in this uh, cluster. This very small sliver down here along the riverbank uh, is 14 and a half uh, acre parcel, which was granted to, uh, to James Beard. Uh, James Beard was the proprietor of Beard's Ferry, which was formally chartered, chartered in 1756, but had existed uh, some years uh, earlier. Uh, the, uh, the plat itself for this 14-acre parcel um, identified the road to James Beard's Ferry. In 1761, Jared Nelson, spelled N-E-I-L-S-O-N, purchased these 14 and a half acres. So Beard's Ferry became Nelson's Ferry, and uh, uh, with the passage of time, uh, the spelling of Nelson uh, gradually became the N-E-L-S-O-N that, uh, that we're accustomed to. Of course, uh, Nelson's Ferry is uh, mentioned frequently in the context of the American Revolution. Uh, the road that uh, proceeded north from uh, from Nelson's Ferry would have crossed this, would have crossed uh, these couple of tracks. This, this cluster in the upper right really will be eventually will be shifted down here to fill this uh, notch. So that means that these two tracks would be sitting basically in this position, and uh, th these two tracks were granted to a gentleman named. Uh, William Osborne in uh, 1747. Um, the road from the ferry surely crossed the land that was granted originally to uh, Osborne. Uh, mortgages in uh, 1786 and 1795 uh, specifically mention a store and a tavern on one of these tracks and it uh, seems likely that the store and the tavern uh, would have uh, been along the road from the ferry. Um, Referring again to Muzan's map, uh, the road that uh, proceeds north from, uh, from Nelson's Ferry, uh, when it got just to the north of uh, the uh, Savannah, uh, the road forked, um, and in that, uh, in that fork in the road there's a dot which uh, seems to imply that it was uh, Thomas Sumter's uh, residence uh, at that point. So, so maybe, uh, maybe it's some at some time, we'll be able to come up with a more specific uh, location for uh, for Thomas Sumter's uh, residence uh, back in that time. I know that's something that George Summers would like very much for us to be able to identify as a more specific location for uh, Thomas Sumter's uh, residence. Uh, moving on to the next parcel here, um, most of the plats in this cluster were lands granted to members of the Nelson family. Uh, this uh, cluster is in the vicinity of the Cutto unit of uh, present-day Santee uh, Wildlife Refuge. Um, at the very top uh, is uh, Potato Creek. Uh, so even back in the 1700s, uh, Potato Creek uh, had that name. Uh, it's interesting that many of the creeks uh, in uh, Clarendon County uh, uh, the, 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 names, the same names by which they're known today were the names uh, with which they were identified uh, uh, long years ago, although often the spelling uh, had many variations. Uh, most of the tracts in this, uh, in this uh, cluster were consolidated into a plantation called Indigo Hill. And, uh, before we move on, I'll just point to this tract down here, a 500-acre tract granted to uh, Josiah Nelson, and we'll be seeing that uh, tract on, uh, on, another, uh, on another cluster. Uh, with this being the, the Francis Marion Symposium, uh, here is a plat for 450 acres granted to Francis Marion in 1768. Uh, we'll see the location of this tract on the uh, on the next plat cluster. Uh, this tract was not part of Francis Marion's Pond Bluff plantation. Um, Marion sold this uh, 450 acre tract to uh, Matthew Nelson uh, in 1768, uh, only a couple of months after the tract was uh, granted to Marion. 
having uh, referred to a Pond Bluff plantation. Uh, this is uh, a part of a 1774 deed of conveyance pertaining to Pond Bluff plantation. But uh, there were uh, two adjacent Pond Bluff plantations on the south side of the Santee River, according to the uh, Waterman Report of 1939. The uh, Pond Bluff that uh, we all associate with uh, Francis Marion and the uh, Pond Bluff owned by uh, uh, the Ashby family. So this, uh, in this 1774 deed, uh, Ephraim Mitchell conveyed 1,800 acres to Thomas Ashby and Anthony Ashby. Uh, the deed uh, specifically described that plantation or tract of land called or known by the name of Pond Bluff. With uh, 700 acres uh, being uh, south of the Santee River, the uh, the deed of conveyance also uh, uh, conveyed 1,100 acres north of the river. Now, many tracts, many ownerships, um, or many grantees in this cluster, and uh, there are still more tracts uh, to be added. Um, should comment, there's really nothing magic or nothing sacred about the cluster names. Uh, we've simply I, I assigned cluster names just to facilitate our uh, communications uh, with each other. Um, so here again is the 500 acre track that you saw at the bottom of the uh, Nelson cluster. So you can see how the Nelson cluster, uh, the relative position of the Nelson cluster with respect to this uh, McKelvey flood cluster. And we looked at the Francis Marion's 450 acre tract, which he sold to uh, Matthew Nelson, and there's uh, Francis Marion's uh, 450 acres. Um, well, let's get back for just a moment to the 1,800 acres uh, sold by uh, in 1774 by Ephraim Mitchell to uh, the Ashby's on both sides of the river. Uh, the description of the 700 acres south of the river uh, indicated that uh, the uh, land being purchased by the Ashby's uh, bounded to the west on lands of Francis Marion. Uh, well, the 1,100 acres north of the river um, would be uh, part shown in, the, in this cluster. Um, several years uh, earlier, in uh, 1767, John Mitchell had purchased um, the western, pardon me, the eastern 600 acres of this uh, McKelvey tract, and uh, John Mitchell in 1767 had also purchased the western 500 acres of the thousand acre tract of uh, William Flood. So uh, those 1,100 acres um, purchased in 1767 by John Mitchell fit the description of the 1,100 acres sold in 1774 by Ephraim Mitchell to uh, Thomas and Anthony Ashby. Uh, the 1774 deed described the 1,100 acres is bounded on the south, partly by the Santee River. Here we've got the Santee River. Uh, and partly on lands of Gabriel uh, Marion. Now we have not drawn in the tract, and that would be somewhat of a circuitous uh, path to, uh, 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 in terms of uh, Gabriel Marion uh, being identified with uh, the tract that I believe it is. Uh, to the east, according to the 1774 deed, were lands of William Flood, so that would be the remnants uh, of the uh, thousand acre tract. Uh, to the north, on lands of uh, Josiah Nelson, so here again. Uh, to the northwest, on lands of James McKelvey, so the remnant uh, of the 1300 acre uh, tract. And uh, to the westward, on lands of John Scrine. So, uh, pretty clear from the description that the uh, 1,100 acres were in this vicinity. So it's uh, gratifying to know that our plat mapping really works. Um, moving on to the uh, cluster that we've called the Davis Cluster. 
Um, the west portion of this cluster actually intermingles with the uh, McKelvey uh, flood cluster at which we just looked. Um, in addition to uh, lands of David Davis and James Davis up through here, um, we see tracks granted to uh, Theodore Gilliard, uh, one such track being there, another one there. Gilliard purchased that tract uh, from the original grantee. Uh, also, we're starting to get into some tracks of the Candy family. Uh, here's a 400 acre tract, another 100 acre tract right there to members of the Candy family. And uh, half of this particular tract, um, 656 acres uh, granted originally to Paul D. St. Julian uh, became land of uh, Job Marion uh, through, uh, through marriage. Um, so, moving on. Uh, Little River Island uh, at the uh, at the mouth of uh, uh, where the Saint, where Little River uh, emptied into uh, the Santee River. Um, Muzon, 1770. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, Little River Island was granted to Theodore Gaillard in 1756 and became known. Uh, as Gaillard Island. And uh, in this uh, next uh, frame graphic, uh, Muzon's uh, 1775 map identified Gaillard Island. And uh, it's uh, still identifiable in, uh, in today's landscape, a short distance below the, the uh, Lake Marion Dam. So, uh, whoops, wrong button. I'll get it right eventually. So here's the Lake Marion Dam. Um, and on this frame in the lower right corner, uh, the red dots outline uh, Gilliard Island. And uh, uh, here uh, George uh, has uh, helped us by circling a, a short remnant of Little River. Uh, that uh, It's obvious that most of Little River was uh, covered over by uh, the formation of uh, Lake Marion, but a uh, short segment of Little River uh, uh, shown there. Um, plat for 500 acres to uh, Samuel Candy. Again, we're continuing uh, to move our way down river um, toward the uh, southeastern corner of uh, present day Clarendon County and uh, toward the uh, Clarendon Williamsburg County line. Um, this plat uh, provides helpful details. Uh, not all plats uh, show nearly as much detail as this one does, but it shows the Santee River Swamp, shows us the Savannah, presumably the Carolina Bay, shows a couple of creeks converging up here, and of interest as well is uh, the note at the very top of the plat indicating that this uh, was land uh, of Richard Butler. Um, now Richard Butler's land um, was identified as Mount Hope Plantation in the deed of conveyance when Joseph Candy purchased the tract in 1739. The deed recited that Richard Butler had purchased 560 acres in 1731 from Landgrave Edmund Bellinger to whom the land was granted in 17, 1730. Oh, so far as I know, uh, this uh, land of Richard Butler was perhaps the earliest land grant in, um, in present day Calhoun County. I don't, I don't remember seeing any uh, land earlier than, uh, than that tract uh, that Richard Butler acquired. Uh, again, the, the same plat for the 500 acres to Samuel Candy, uh, the topo map showing Butler's Bay, Mount Hope Swamp, and uh, then an aerial photograph of uh, some of the some of the area as well. Okay, the Candy Cluster. Um, knowing that John Candy um, and Francis Marion were friends, uh, George Summers urged us to find the lands of John Candy. 
Uh, this cluster is incomplete, uh, but I think we've made good progress to uh, arrange many of the parcels that were granted to Joseph Candy, Samuel Candy, John Candy, William Candy, James Candy. Um, and again, here's the, the 500 acre uh, track that we've looked at on the, the uh, two previous uh, graphics, so the 500 acres uh, for Samuel Candy. Um, land grants alone do not fully account for lands owned by John Candy. Uh, for example, uh, John Candy uh, purchased several tracks from his brother Samuel, uh, which uh, Samuel had inherited uh, from their father, uh, Joseph Candy. So uh, memorials and deeds of conveyance are important tools in terms of uh, being able to uh, track uh, the uh, uh, ownership of, uh, of land. Uh, a few moments ago, we mentioned Mount Hope Plantation, which uh, Joseph Candy had purchased from, um, from Richard Butler's estate. Now here, whoops, here is another Mount Hope Plantation. Uh, this one would be a short distance to the east. Uh, Richard Butler's land would have been up in here. This was somewhat to the east, probably in Williamsburg County. Um, and this was land that was granted to a gentleman named uh, William Cleland or Cleland, whatever the uh, pronunciation, in uh, 1736. Okay, an interesting plat here. Um, this plat was uh, surveyed for Daniel Hayward, but the land was actually granted to Henry Muzon. Uh, this is a plat for a thousand acres. Um, and a plat such as this is uh, uh, extraordinarily helpful to me uh, to identify and arrange other plats for the cluster. Uh, you can see various names here. Uh, Whoops, uh, Henry Montgomery, William Montgomery, James Lord, Elias Ball, John Bull. So it's just having uh, all the, that many adjacent landowners identified really helps greatly to uh, um, try to uh, identify the other tracks in the cluster. So from that standpoint, uh, this tract is uh, is uh, very helpful. Um, now for Jim Queen, such a track might be a nightmare to, uh, to draw. I'm not sure if Jim considers this to be a nightmare or a challenge. Do you want to comment on that, Jim? Richard, you might mention it. I couldn't hardly read any of the measurements on this track here. Right, Jim. The way I got the measurements was off on the majority tracks, but it came, to work, it came together pretty well. Right. Yes, yeah, Jim's point is uh, well taken on many of these uh, uh, colonial plats. The, uh, the bearings and the uh, lengths of the uh, lines are uh, very difficult to read, and, and this uh, particular plat uh, is especially difficult to uh, uh, figure out what some of the, uh, what some of the dimensions are. Uh, so with this uh, tract as uh, sort of the the skeleton. Uh, here are some some of the other tracks that have been uh, added to uh, form the cluster. And again, there's uh, still more work to be uh, to be done on uh, this cluster. Uh, this Muzan cluster um, was directly north of the Candy cluster at which we just looked. Um, it uh, uh, includes. Uh, parcels granted to members of the Candy family. Um, and another parcel yet to be added, the 500 acre tract to John Candy uh, will fit in here and uh, should tie into the Candy cluster uh, down here on the, on the lower side. Dick, I suggest you go ahead and move forward to the uh, Singleton cluster. Did you do that? Okay. Scroll through and take them up to the single cluster and make a presentation about that. Okay. Um, the, uh, at previous uh, Francis Marion symposiums, we've heard about uh, the encounter at Halfway Swamp where Francis Marion 
and the British officers selected 20 men uh, to face off against each other. But uh, during the night, the uh, British slipped away and proceeded northward. Uh, the Patriots pursued the British and caught up with them in the vicinity of Singleton's Mill and Matthew Singleton's house. But because of smallpox at uh, Matthew Singleton's house, the uh, Patriots did not engage the British at Singleton's house. So uh, the question arises, uh, where was Singleton's house? The, the location of Singleton's Mill seems to be generally pretty well accepted as uh, being in present uh, points at uh, State Park. Uh, some accounts uh, seem to believe that uh, Matthew Singleton uh, residence was also in uh, points at State Park. But uh, plots such as this can help us to get a better understanding of, uh, of the location of uh, Singleton's residence. Uh, this plat uh, showed, the, the plat is for 150 acres, but on the adjoining, just across the property line, uh, which George has circled here, is uh, Mr. Singleton's house. And from Mr. Singleton's house, there is a path leading to the mill. From the house, there's also a path leading to Campbell Creek. Now, here, uh, uh, Jim has uh, drawn a plat cluster to help us consider the, the location of uh, Singleton's house in reference to, uh, to Campbell Creek. Uh, here again is uh, Singleton's uh, house up in here. Uh, here's Campbell Creek down here. So uh, uh, on an enlarged view, again, uh, Matthew Singleton's house, uh, Campbell Creek, Shanks Creek, which uh, presumably would have been the location of uh, Singleton's Mill. Uh, but it's clear from, uh, uh, from, from this uh, plat cluster that Singleton's uh, residence was a considerable distance uh, north of Campbell Creek. Now we've uh, got a, here we have a topographic map of points at State Park. Uh, this dashed line shows the northern boundary of points at State Park. And here is Campbell Creek, very close to the northern boundary of points at State Park. So considering the closeness of Campbell Creek to Poinsett State Park, it's clear that Matthew Singleton's residence to the north was certainly not in Poinsett State Park. So uh, it's just interesting to be able to uh, uh, shed some new light uh, uh, through, uh, through such mapping uh, as to uh, the location of some of the historical features. Do we, George, we need to move on to the conclusion, do we? Pardon me? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, if, uh, if you're interested uh, later to talk about, we'll, what we'll skip over is uh, uh, some, some work that we've done uh, in terms of the location of the St. Mark's Parish Glebe land, but we'll uh, skip over that for now and uh, move on toward, uh, toward the end of this presentation. So let me get on the get on the right page here. Um, okay. Um, remember at the start of the presentation, I referred to the uh, to the final exam. So I urged you to remember the number of how many feet in a chain. So what's that number? Sixty-six. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. You've uh, learned well. And this is the last question on the test can earn extra credit on the exam if you can identify this map. Uh, but Karen McNutt is disqualified because she heard the answer yesterday. So uh, other than George and Carol and Karen, everybody else is eligible to uh, earn the extra credit by identifying this, uh, this map. The, uh, the index of the Department of Archives and History lists this map as a plat of 2,546 acres divided among 14 individuals. That's, uh, that's the extent of the description that uh, 
that we uh, have. Now that particular title is, uh, is misleading. Uh, rather than a large tract uh, divided among 14 individuals, uh, the map actually shows many tracts that were consolidated into a plantation on both sides of a river. Of course, you can see the river winding its way through here. So, can anybody identify this plantation? I'll be surprised if you can, actually. But uh, uh, tomorrow night we will meet Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. This map does not mention Pinckney, and the map does not identify the river. Uh, from, uh, from my plat research, I recognize the names and locations of tracts on this map. Um, the unnamed river is the Congaree River, and this map is the plantation that Charles Coatsworth Pinckney and Edward Rutledge purchased in 1783 from Henry Middleton. Uh, the north side of the plantation north of the river is now part of Congaree National Park and the uh, south side remains uh, privately owned land in uh, Calhoun County. Um, so tomorrow evening then when you, uh, you know, meet uh, General Pinckney uh, you will have uh, already seen one of his uh, plantations. I'll just show you this map uh, briefly, and this is a, a hand-drawn uh, plat map uh, drawn about 10 years ago by John Seeley, showing uh, land grants in uh, the area that became Congaree Swamp National Monument, now Congaree National Park. Uh, so the, the portion of the plantation of which we were just looking is uh, uh, down in here. So some of the tracks that were north of the river on the uh, previous graphic are these uh, tracks uh, down in this area. So just a few concluding remarks here. Uh, the plat mapping project in which uh, you know, Jim and I have been working uh, for the past year and a half uh, fits under the very large umbrella of the Historic Mapping Congress which focuses on historic mapping in the states of South Carolina and North Carolina. Charles Baxley uh, uh, is one of the leaders in the Historic Mapping Congress, and I would uh, encourage, uh, encourage you to talk uh, today and tomorrow with uh, Charles if you want to learn more about the uh, this Historic Mapping Congress. So I think that, whoops, I think that brings us to the end of uh, of the presentation, or at least our time has run out. So uh, we have uh, we have uh, a few minutes for some questions. Um, and if you have questions, uh, hopefully uh, Jim and I have some answers. So Jim, do you want to come on up here as well? Uh, I should mention that uh, you know, we didn't talk specifically about the uh, uh, the software program that uh, Jim has used this so in your questions you might want to be uh, uh, seeking uh, some information about the software program as well. Questions please. Yeah the, the boundaries for the tracks they s seem haphazard. What did they base uh, what was the basis for uh, for the boundaries of the tracks? Usually, when you draw a state line, it follows a river or, or uh, uh, where there were there seem to be some guidelines or uh, limits as to how much river frontage the the, the aspect between the, the length of river frontage versus the depth of the track. I'm not sure that they always adhere to that, but uh, my recollection is that. Uh, uh, at least at some points in time, there was a, uh, an expectation that the amount of river frontage would, uh, not, would not exceed one fourth of the depth of the tract. So what, that, what determined the size of a tract? In some cases, uh, it was uh, based on um, the, in, in petitioning for land, if the uh, petitioner or his wife children or slaves had not uh, previously uh, been factored into the uh, into the count so far as uh, 
receiving land. I think this formula changed a little bit, but at one point in time, I think it was something like 50 acres per person. Uh, but I think that was at a particular snapshot in time when the 50 acre uh, number was uh, was applicable. But a number of the petitions would, I uh, didn't bring one along to read to you as an example, but they tend to say, uh, you know, that the petitioner uh, has uh, not previous, nor his wife, nor his uh, X number of children uh, ever received a grant of land and therefore prays uh, to uh, be granted uh, uh, land uh, to cultivate, uh, so on, so on. So, uh, uh, and then sometimes it would, uh, uh, with uh, you know, additional children being born or uh, additional slaves being acquired, that would be a basis for uh, petitioning to receive additional land. Yes, sir. Uh, could you go back to your Matthew Singleton uh, map you had? Can you identify where the cemetery is? Is that near his house? Uh, I'm, glad, been to the cemetery. I'm glad you mentioned that. That was a comment that I uh, skipped over in my remarks here. I think the uh, the uh, if. if if the cent if the locate if the cemetery location is a valid clue, and I think it is, um, the location of the cemetery would suggest that uh, Matthew Singleton's residence was uh, definitely was was north of, of Poinsett State Park. Um, I, um, I mean, one of the one of the um, persons with whom I network or collaborate on history is. Uh, a fellow named Charles Broadwell in Sumter, and uh, I've talked with uh, Charles about uh, about the cemetery location, and Charles uh, tends to agree that uh, the cemetery location suggests that the Singleton residence would not have been in Poinsett State Park, but would have been north of Poinsett State Park, which would put it close to the cemetery. And the fact that uh, Warehouse Lake is fairly close by there, uh, down it's on the floodplain. Right up at 261 up there. Right. So we thank you. Anybody else, any questions? Dick and Jim have a table at the back with their plats and everything, their clusters and so forth, that you can talk in great detail with them for hours and hours about this. <laughs> More than you ever wanted to know. Right? <laughs> thank you both. Take a 15 minute break. And we've been joined by the sculptor of these beautiful statues here, Bob Baranowski. Wave your hand, Bob.